Hello everybody, good afternoon for those of you joining us here in North America, good evening for those of you in Europe where Sergio is, and welcome to Flight Simulation Association's introduction to helicopter flight simulation. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Evan, one of the two co-founders of Flight Simulation Association. Thank you so much for watching, whether you're on our website, Facebook Live, YouTube, whether you're watching on the Heli Simmer Sergio's YouTube channel, and hello to Drew, thank you for being part of that today to help us out, or you might be listening to us today on Sky Blue Radio Live. So hello to everyone and thank you so much for taking part. Now for those of you who don't know us here at Flight Simulation Association, this is exactly the kind of thing we do. We go out and find really cool people who are super knowledgeable about something. Sometimes, like Sergio, they may have their own website and they may have their own platform. Other times, they're people who just are really, really knowledgeable about a specific subject. And we try to give them a platform and an opportunity to share something new and help you discover something that you might not know about home flight simulation, like helicopters. And of course, our other main mission is to just help introduce people to this amazing hobby that we know and love, whether that's through our show flights and expo or stuff like this we're trying to make it easier for people to dive in and get started whether it's helicopters or civil or combat wherever you are in home flight simulation thanks for joining us today now we are all about questions and comments so my job while well, Sergio is giving you an awesome presentation my job is to go and keep an eye on all of those different channels I just mentioned and collect your comments and questions and share those through and in fact I've already got about three so uh, Dennis and Kevin and John, I have your questions. Thank you. And Donald has already sent in a comment saying he likes the guide that you wrote, Sergio. So there you go. Um, but please, guys, continue to send those through. If you're a Flight Simulation Association member and you're watching on our website, first officers, you have the ability to send in a question right through the site. Have a say, captains, thank you for the support. And of course, you have access to that live chat. Send me a question. And if you're watching on YouTube Live or Facebook, pop a question in there in the comments, and I will do my best to track all of those. And hey, if you're listening on Sky Blue Radio on the Discord, I am there in the on air DJ chat. So send me a question as well. And of course, if you're watching or listening to this uh, on Sky Blue Radio, you want to see the replay because you won't be able to see what Sergio is doing. You can always find the recorded session on flightsimassociation.com slash web webinars, and I'm sure it'll still be up on Sergio's YouTube channel when we're done here today. So let's introduce the person that we're here to actually listen to. Sergio is joining us from Portugal. He is the co-founder, creator, founder, editor, the person behind Helisimmer.com. And if there's one person I can think of in this community who knows helicopters, he's the one. I was going to say it's the biggest helicopter flight simulation website there is. You might say it's the only one. I don't know. But it certainly <laughs> is a phenomenal resource for anyone who's thinking about helicopters. Whenever I get a helicopter question, I'm immediately sending Sergio an email and he answers right away. And in addition to the website, he has his weekly flyby covering content from the week and himself, uh, Belgiode, who's here watching along with us, and Tristan, who is over there in Australia, goes by the name NovaWing24. They do a monthly kind of panel discussion type show called The Three Grumpy Simmers, where they look at everything going on in home flight simulation. Is that, did I about cover everything, Sergio? What I miss? Um, Is that you? Pretty much, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's pretty much it. I've, I've been busy. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and uh, not only that, but for those of you who haven't seen it, if you watch or read along with us and radio check our weekly newsletter, you saw this come out today. Uh, Helisimmer.com is doing their sixth anniversary giveaway. So if you wanted to maybe win a new helicopter that you're going to learn how to fly on this stream, this is a great chance to go and enter totally free. Anybody can enter at Helisimmer.com. There's more than 20 prizes available. Some of them are scenery, some of them are helicopters, a whole bunch of really cool stuff. You can just enter that contest for free right now. If you open up a new tab and go to helisimmer.com and you'll see the link to actually do that. And they can do that until the 24th. Is that right, Sergio? Two days from now? Yeah, until the 24th. Yes, yeah. so until so Monday. So yeah, it's almost over, guys. Hurry up. Good chance. Get that in. And uh, we're going to get started. Sergio has, as you can see on the screen here behind me, put a lot of effort into getting this set up. This is his setup that he's using, and he's by no means a, a newbie when it comes to flight simulation streaming. So I was trying to explain, like, you know, here's how this works, and he's like, no, I got this. I'll just do a good presentation. So he has got <laughs> everything set up to give us a phenomenal show. So I will pass things over to him, and I'll be here looking at all your comments, getting those questions together. So Sergio, I'm uh, looking forward to learning along with you, and please take it away. Thank you very much, and thank you for not uh, raising expectations too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I 
it's not like I was feeling pressure uh, anyway. Thank you very much for having me, Evan. Welcome everyone that's watching um, this stream. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for being part of the community. Thank you very much for for being willing to learn something about helicopters. Like Evan said, I I have a lot on my plate. I have been doing a lot of different things. Um, and today, I I wanted to face this presentation um, in a way which everyone out there could be could relate to. So I'm not. I'm not doing this presentation from the perspective of someone that has a lot of years under their belt, and I'm going, not going to show you a lot of different amazing controls so that um, you get even more frustrated, because I know see, it is frustrating to fly helicopters. I'm going to face this presentation and try to, to teach you and talk to you and show you how you can do it even with the simplest hardware and software. Okay, so. Um, this is what we are going to cover today. I'm going to talk a bit about my background, um, not to show off or anything like that, but just for you to understand where I come from and where I'm trying to go. Um, I'm going to tell you about how I got into helicopters and why they are so cool. Um, I mean, it's precisely because I find helicopters very cool and I found them very cool when I started looking at them and I got into helicopters and I got even more serious about helicopters. I'm then going to talk to you about hardware which I just mentioned that you don't need a lot of different things, very expensive hardware for you to actually start flying helicopters. There are some caveats, but we'll, I'll talk about it later. We're also going to talk about software, mainly the flight simulator that you should probably choose for yourself. I'm then going to talk, to do a very, very easy and fast crash course about how helicopters work, because this goes in hand with um, talking about controls and what they do as well. I'm going to show you, I'm actually going to show you inside X-Plane using the Bell 4 to 9er, how your first takeoff and landing could be or should be um, to the best of my abilities. And uh, it's not going to be easy for me either. And I'm going to explain you why later. And then I'm going to tell you about how to establish a practice routine. And this is, this is actually fun, be, funny because I saw someone on Facebook asking exactly this, how they, could, how they could establish their practice routine. And this is something that I have been planning for some time. It was a coincidence. And I hope that person is here watching the stream with us today so that they can actually, uh, try and understand how they can do it. And at the end, we'll do some do a Q and A. Um, I also told 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 Evan that whenever he finds a question on whatever platform you guys are watching that makes sense, uh, do throughout the presentation for him to do it. So um, we may have some Q and As um, as as we go. So okay, about about me, about my background. Um, like Evan said, I'm the founder of Alexander.com, but this didn't start here. I actually started 25 years ago or so. Um, pretty much like perhaps a lot of you have started. I just love aviation and I started to look at sims back then. And I really love what, um, what was on the market. Nothing like Microsoft Flight Simulator or Explain or any of the sims that we have today. They were very crude, but they actually sucked you in um, into flying um, as much as possible. And I, yes, I did. I, I did flew. Um, I did fly airliners back in in the days. But eventually, I airliners became a bit boring for me. So I I thought I, I sought out something else, and I went after GA, so small aircraft, which were more um, stick and rudder. I had I had more to control. But still, I, I wanted a bit more. I want something something more exciting. And eventually, I I found out about helicopters. Um, I started doing, I started going into uh, websites and forums and finding more and more and more about them. I eventually started up helicimmer.com, especially after the disappearance of a website called hovercontrol.com, which was absolutely amazing. And nowadays, I've been spending a lot of my time not only with Helicimmer, the website, but also at events, getting to know people that develop hardware or software, showing helicopters to people, showing them how helicopters work, how they can fly it. Um, get them interested in flying helicopters. Here are my contacts, uh, the website helicimmer.com, and this is my email. You can reach out to me um, whenever is that you want to. So like I was saying, I started with airliners. I eventually moved on to general aviation because it was more exciting, but eventually I found out about helicopters. And I found out about helicopters in Flight Simulator 2000. 
And uh, back then we had um, the Bell Tool 6 for us to fly. And I was very curious because I have flown airliners for some time. I had flown GA for some time, about 10 years or so of uh, flight simulation under my belt, if I wasn't mistaken. But I, I wanted a bit more and I started to look at helicopters. And I actually started to look into helicopters, not just because um, it was in the sim, but also uh, I, I got interested about uh, the types of missions that helicopter did and why the people actually like to fly them inside the sim. And helicopters are pretty cool. Um, with helicopters, you can pretty much take off or land anywhere. You can do some all sorts of different kinds of missions like search and rescue. You can steal, um, move people around and cargo around. You can, you can, have, you can do a plethora of other things. Um, for example, you can actually bring a VIP or bring people, passengers, to a night rate, which you cannot do on an airliner. So helicopters started to grow more and more and more and more, and I started to be very, very excited about helicopters. But there was a problem, and the problem is that helicopters are hard. And my second lesson was that helicopters are really hard. And I know they are, like I said, I know they are really frustrating, and it's really, 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 really hard for us to, uh, to actually learn how to control them. And there are a lot of different factors that sometimes pull you down. And if you do understand those factors and you can solve them or at least acknowledge that they exist, you will probably at least feel less frustrated because there are some things that you can do to improve your flying, your helicopter flying. There are some things that you may actually need some money into it for you to actually control better the helicopters. So, but at least if you cannot do it, but understand why is it that, it, that it's happening, that you have struggling and having those difficulties, perhaps your pain will decrease. And I hope it does. Um, over time, as I started to fly more and more helicopters, I found out that there are three secrets for helicopter flying, which are the major ones. And those are practice, practice, practice. This is an inside joke inside the community, but it's very much true. Yes, hardware has a, a huge, takes a huge part of it. Software takes a huge part of it. Settings take a huge part of it. But you need to practice. You need to be very patient. And you need to be constant trying to, ach to achieve the next bar and progress and go over and over and over and over. Okay, so for you to be able to understand all this, how, how, this, how this works, how helicopters work, how controls work, how hardware and software might are a huge part of um, controlling helicopters. And it does make quite a difference, especially when compared with fixed wing aviation. We are going to start by talking about hardware. And yes, there are some amazing hardware, um, hardware controllers out there. I do have uh, some amazing ones. But the thing is, and this is how I started, you can start with a simple joystick. This is actually the joystick I started flying helicopters with an old Microsoft Sidewinder joystick. It, it had the two axes of so pitch and roll, plus the yaw axis using the twist grip, and it had a throttle. And I use the throttle as a collective, of course. And I'm going to explain a bit more about the controls um, a bit further down the road. Okay, but this is what I had back then. Of course, I had evolved, and nowadays I use VR. This is the Reverb G2. I use VR and the ProFlight Trainer Puma control set, which is absolutely amazing. And it does make a difference. These two objects, these two little, well, not a little, but these two hardware items really made a huge difference on my helicopter flying down the road. But today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how you can start flying helicopters using just a simple joystick, just like I did before. And we are going to use the Thrustmaster T16000M which is a relatively cheap um, joystick that you can buy pretty much anywhere. But of course, any other joystick that has at least these two axes, so pitch and roll, throttle, and the yaw control through twist grip or whatever works just fine. Um, Sergio, and you, you need it. It's yeah, Evan. Ahead, I'll, be the, I'll be the magical, just disembodied voice speaking over the stream for the next little <laughs> while here. Can you say what that, right. what that joystick was again? Because we had a question that is exactly perfect for you to answer. The question is from John, and his question is, can I fly a helicopter with only a Thrustmaster T-16000M controller? 
Yes, you can. And that's exactly <laughs> that the great? controller that I'm going to use. Yeah, it is. It's 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 like a it's a two in one already. I already got two for two <laughs> with uh with the the routine and the joystick. Yes, you can you can actually control helicopters, fly helicopters with the T16 uh, 16,000 M. It's Beautiful. not going to be easy. I have to be honest with you. It's not going to be easy. I'm going to explain more about it later. Um, a bit later. Uh, done the presentation, but yes, you can use it to start flying helicopters, and it, it's the one that I'm going to use and show you. You are going to watch to see it later in action, um, as I do the demonstration. Perfect. Okay. And keep those questions coming, everybody. Lots of great questions and comments. Donald says he flew the Bell 430 and Blackhawks and FSX. Love the helicopters guide on the website so far. So thank you to writing that. And a bunch of great comments on the helisimmer.com YouTube channel as well. People saying they use the Logitech Extreme 3D Pro. They use a bunch of different sticks and hardware options. So people who are kind of curious about that, a great discussion going on on the helisimmer.com YouTube channel. Okay, awesome. Um, I wish I could watch it, but I'm I'm busy doing You're the presentation. You're busy, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I'll I'll drop by later, and I hope that if you guys have any questions that I don't answer here, um, you can actually go and uh, leave a comment at the at the video at helisimmer.com, and I, I'll get back to it later, and either do a video or reply there or something like that. So okay, anyway. What we have today, or what I am going to show you today, the joystick that we just mentioned, it's pretty much, in terms of functionality, it's exactly the same thing that I had back when I started. So it's, uh, I'm going to show you exactly what, what, I, what I did when I started learning. Of course, we have cool stuff like, you know, this Verpil um, Collective, which is just amazing. Um, and I, I really, I really recommend you get one, but if you don't, a joystick will be more than enough. Now, there are, some tips and tricks uh, which can help you achieve better results with a joystick. Now, I know it is very, very difficult, if not impossible, to do this using uh, the Thrustmaster T16000M uh, or other joysticks like the Logitech, the one that you just mentioned, Evan. But there's a trick for some of the joysticks that are out there, especially the ones that have the spring showing, which is you can actually compress the spring of the joystick. Yes, the joystick will fall down to the right or the left or whatever because it will not be centered. But trust me, if you manage to do this on your joystick, you will find it is a lot more, a lot easier for you to control the helicopter. It made a whole bunch of difference for me once I did it. I saw this tip on, I think it was overcontrol.com back at the time. And when I tried it, yeah, I was just blown away. And the same goes for the pedals. If you, okay, sorry, just let me, if you actually remove the spring of the pedals, like for the example on the Verpal pedal, uh, you'll have a lot more controls over what you're doing on the helicopter because you are not, here's the thing, because there is a spring and a self-centering mechanism, you are going to be fighting that spring. You are going to be fighting your controller. And this is especially true, and I'm going to, show you that later when I'm, when I'm, I'm going to be flying X-Plane 11. And that's especially true when you also have to control your yaw using the twist grip. So it's, like I said, it is possible for you to use this joystick, but it's not like you're going to have your life easier. Okay. It's going to be a bit harder, but it's still, it's still very much doable. Okay. So in terms of hardware guys, you can start with any joystick that you have. If you can do these modifications, these simple modifications of compressing or removing the spring, it will be a huge, huge help. And I promise you, you will notice the difference. Okay. So, hardware is done. Let's talk a bit about software. And uh, a lot of people ask me what sim they should be using. And the truth is that there are a lot of different sims in the market. I'm listing um, a few of them here, at least the ones that are better known in the community. Everyone knows a Microsoft Flight Simulator, which just came out um, <clears throat> very recently and uh, people are going crazy about it. But we do have Aerofly FS2, which is absolutely amazing for helicopters, especially for the R22. And then we have other sims as well, like DCS World Flight Gear, which is a free and open source sim with amazing helicopters. Take a look at it if you can. It, it, it doesn't cost anything, so it's not like you're going to waste any money. Microsoft Flight Simulator, like I said before, 
prepared or P3D and XP11. These are the better known SIMs out there in the market. Now, people ask me, which SIM should I be using? Um, and we often see these, uh, these kinds of questions on several forums or Facebook groups or whatever social media. And people immediately uh, answer with whatever SIM they use because it's their experience, right? But I tend to not provide that answer right away. And I try to understand what is it that you as a seamer are trying to achieve and get from the sim, because all these sims offer you different things. For example, DCS offers you military helicopters. You can actually blow up, blow up stuff, uh, but perhaps you don't want to blow up stuff. You just want to fly around. Yeah, you can still do that. You can still do that on DCS. That, that's the truth, right? But DCS has amazing graphics, an amazing flight model, some great helicopters. It is, a still, it is a bit limited in terms of the amount of helicopters that it has, and it is very limited in terms of scenery. So you cannot fly the world, but it's an amazing, an amazing sim. And then you have other sims, like for example, X-Plane, in which you can fly the world, in which you have uh, quite a few helicopters, amazing flight dynamics. And then you have others like, for example, uh, DC, um, I'm sorry, Airfly FS2, which is very limited in terms of helicopters as well, even more limited than uh, DCS because there are less helicopters and very limited in terms of scenery as well because you cannot really fly the world. You have some small sections or regions where you can fly it that are very well done. Rest of the world, it's pretty blurry. But here's the thing, and that this is something that I already said, but I'm going to repeat so that you guys understand. The R22 in Aerofly FS2 is probably the best R22 that you will find. And it's probably, well, it's not probably, it's one of the best helicopters of all themes that I'm showing you here, okay? So to answer your question, you first need to understand what is it that you want to take from the sims. Because if you want to fly the world, the sim like DCS, for example, it's out of the question, right? But you can probably want to just fly in a small portion of the world. It doesn't even matter for you. And you want something that you can actually even use for military purposes. You can use ECS. It, it, is, it has a lot to do with what is it that you want. And the fact is, indeed, I tell this a lot to people, you have to pick the scene that fits your needs. Okay, just try and understand what is it that you need from the sim and try to get the scene that fits those needs. And another thing that I would like for everyone to understand is that you shouldn't be afraid to try different sims. I see, I see a lot of discussions out there on social media, um, almost tribal discussions in which, you know, someone uses x or Microsoft Flight Simulator. It doesn't matter which sim. You know, they are stuck to that sim. And if, if someone else talks about other sims, they, they kind of get angry because people use other sims. It's okay. And I actually recommend it because here's the thing. The more you know about other sims, the more you know about, if you are a Microsoft Flight Simulator user, the more you know about Aerofly FS2 and DCS and x -Plane and all the other sims, the better you understand the strength and the weaknesses of not only those sims, but also from the sim that you are using. And you will get used to using those different flight dynamics, and you'll probably be in a position in which you can actually try and ask developers or demand the developers of the sim that you use as a main sim, you know, guys, this sim is doing something that is really nice and really cool and it's better than yours, please add it to your sim. So in my perspective and my opinion, you should not be afraid to try other sims. You should actually get, you know, as, much, as many sims as you can, try them out. I'm not saying for you to invest a lot of money on all the sims because I know a lot of you have invested. I have invested a lot of money on sim X or sim Y. Um, I'm not saying that you should do that and invest a lot of money on all the sims. But at least if you can give them a try, give them a chance, perhaps you'll find something that you like it on, that, on those sims. And perhaps you can actually add those sims to your portfolio. And instead of just using one sim, you can use more than one sim. Now, what is the sim that I use? And I'm not telling you to use this sim. This is the sim that I use. And I personally use x as my um, main sim. And why do I use man x -Plane? It has great flight dynamics. Helicopters are absolutely fantastic in X-Plane. Um, uh, fixed wing as well, but our goal is helicopters here. It's what I'm talking about, and it has great flight dynamics. It has a good catalog of helicopters. I have, um, there's helicopters for almost all tastes, you know, from uh, 
small helicopters, light helicopters, medium helicopters, heavy helicopters. You have a lot of different things. You can fly the world, which is very important for me, especially because I like to fly in Europe, mainly Portugal, and you don't have a lot of that in DCS, for example. It's impossible. I, I, I wouldn't be able to fly in Portugal uh, in DCS. And finally, virtual reality. And virtual reality makes a huge difference, and it's, uh, it's, it's a game changer. And uh, I just want to talk very briefly about virtual reality and why is it that I think it's beneficial for helicopter flying. First of all, it puts you inside the cockpit, okay? And you can actually have a better sense, a better notion of where things are. It has natural head tracking. It's not like you are using track IR in which you just move a little bit of the head, but the eyes are still going in this direction and the monitor, the screen, the camera moves a lot. You are actually moving the camera naturally like you do in real life when you're driving your car. And that's exactly what happens when you are flying. And then you have depth perception, a little better, a much better depth perception. You have a better perception of the distances inside the scene. So you know more exactly where you are in regards, for example, with a runway or a helipad or something like that. So it's it's really, it's really very important. And it is all in all, a game changer. It's not just because it's nice. It's not just because it's cool. It's because all these things that I just told you actually make a huge difference in flying helicopters. And especially because you'll get, because of their perception and the bigger field of view, you'll get a better perception of what the helicopter is doing inside the virtual world. Okay? Um, just just come finish. in and just talk about a couple quick things on, on Sims and uh, Daniel, Dennis, and Captain Bo, I have your questions. Thank you. Uh, just going to point out on the concept of flight simulators, really interesting stat if you're a nerd like me who loves statistics. About 30% of flight simmers in the Navigraph survey tell us that they fly more than one sim. So you're certainly not alone in suggesting that any sims are good ones. And Ian off of the helisimmer.com YouTube channel says the best sim to learn to fly helicopters on is the one you already have and are familiar with, which I think is great. And he's flown seven simulators, he says. X-Plane 11, DCS, Arma 3, P3D, Aerofly. So I think he probably has a pretty good background to say that. Yeah, pretty much. It's exactly uh, uh, all those all those things. Well, um, to be honest, and I think there's a there's a guy called Stuart Cassie, which is a flight. It's a member of flight FG UK. Um, flight Gears probably is, is the one that I don't touch that much, but I I pretty much try all the sims and test all the sims. So I have experience with all the sims as well. That's why I tell you and I'm telling you guys that you should try other sims as well. Don't don't, don't just be stuck in your sim. Is your sim the best one for you? absolutely use it, you know, just enjoy it, but do give the others a chance because you, you may be missing out and you will learn a lot by, by knowing those things as well. So thank you. Thank you for, for stepping in, um, Evan, and, and adding that. Um, now I'm going to talk about a subject which is very dear to me. And I, I'm sure that Belgiode and um, Mofo Wing 24, so Drew and Tristan, if they are watching this, they are probably going, oh, no. Yeah, and it's the must-have add-ons. And um, this, is, is, this is the best-kept secret of all, the must-have add-ons for helicopters. There are none. <laughs> that is the truth. I'm not going to tell you, and you shouldn't actually fill your sim with add-ons. Yes, there are must-have. You, you must have at least a helicopter. Um, and uh, very often, I don't recommend the default helicopters, even in X-Plane. I don't like the default helicopters, the S76. I hope that X-Plane -Plane 12 um, changes my mind in regards with, uh, with that, with the new R22. But the must-have add-on that you should probably get is you know, the, your favorite helicopter, the best helicopter you can get for your own reasons, and um, mm. the best tri-stick that you can get if you can get it. Other than that, guys, really use whatever is it that you feel the need to use. If you feel the need to use a weather engine, by all means, install a weather engine. If you have the feel to use Ortho 4XP in X-Plane, by all means, use Ortho 4XP. The must have add-ons that you must have are the ones that you miss. So I'm not going to do any crazy recommendations. I actually use my seams very lean with as little add-ons as possible so that um, the, the seams perform as, as you know, best that they can. 99% of issues with the sims come from add-ons, from third-party add-ons, not the actual sims themselves. There are exceptions. There are some versions that may be broken, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we know all that. 
But a lot of the times it has to do with add-ons. So keep it lean. And if you keep it lean, um, things will go a lot smoother. All right, so we talk about hardware. We talk about software. There are probably even more, um, uh, you have even more doubts than you had before because I didn't tell you exactly what is it that you should be using. But here's the thing. Flight seeming is a very good personal experience. I hope I've at least helped you guide in the right way. And what we are going to do now, we're going to have a crash course about helicopters and how helicopters work. And to do that, I have this little, little fellow here um, to help me out. And uh, let me see if, uh, okay, here he goes. And I'm going to talk a bit, a bit about helicopters work, how these different parts work and what the controls do. Okay, so we have the main rotor here, of course, which is controlled by the engine. And the engine is controlled by the throttle, all right? Um, you open up the throttle, the engine increases the RPM and the rotor increases the RPM as well. Um, fun fact, usually for you to actually climb or descend, it's not the difference on the RPM. You're not increasing the RPM to make it go, make the helicopter go higher or lower. Um, the RPM keeps, stays the same. You usually use the throttle, on helicopters that don't have a system called the governor to keep the RPM at 100%. But we're not talking, we're not going to talk about that today. Um, what actually gets, adds lift or reduces lift from the rotor disc is the angle of the blades. And that is controlled by the collector. Now, on some, on some seams, like Explain, for example, you do have an axis for the collector. Okay. And that is the axis that you should add to your. Throttle, and this, this, this is where a lot of people get confused, okay? The throttle on your joystick should be assigned to the collector, okay? On seems like X-Plane or DCS or, for example, Aeroflight FS2. To add up to the mix and to add up to the confusion, some other seams like FSX and P3D do not have a collective axis. On those sims, you are going to assign the throttle of your joystick to the throttle of the sim. And the throttle of the sim actually controls the collective. I know it's confusing. I'm sorry, not my fault. Go complain with the guys from, <laughs> from Lockheed Martin or P3D. But in general, for all the other sims, the ones that actually have the axis for the collective, you want to assign the throttle on your joystick to the collective to move the blades, to change the pitch of the blades and increase or decrease lift on the rotor system, okay? When the rotor spins, there's actually a reaction by the helicopter, according to, the, to Newton's third law, which makes the fuselage spin in the, in the other way. And that is why we have this little propeller back here, the tail rotor, and the tail rotor acts to it is used to counteract that that torque, the torque from the from the main engine that makes the fuselage spin. It is also responsible for by, for for you for you the action of the helicopter, the yaw action of the helicopter, and this is the this is controlled by the pedals. Okay, so when you assign yaw, you are actually assigning the control of the tail rotor. Other than that, you need to actually move the helicopter forwards and backwards and sideways. And for that, you use the cyclic, which is the grip of the joystick. And the cyclic also controls the pitch of the blades, but instead of controlling them collectively, like the collective, so when you pull the collective up, you are actually increasing the pitch of all the blades and the helicopter tends to rise. The cyclic does the same, but instead of doing on all the blades, it does it so that, for example, when you want to actually move forward, it will, it's not exactly like this, okay? I'm not going to get into any technicality, so I'm, I'm going to tell you this as if it, if it was completely true, but there are some other physics and some other guys are watching this and saying, okay, this is wrong information. It is enough information for you to understand what happens. When you pull the cyclic forward, the cyclic forward, you are actually increasing the um, lifts on the back of the rotor system and decreasing on the front and it's pushing the helicopter forward. Okay, if you pull the collective backwards, it does the opposite and then the helicopter either reduces speed or goes forward. 
And if you um, pull the collector to the left or to the right, the helicopter will eventually um, roll to the left or to the right. Okay, so just to recap, the joystick grip controls the cyclic, which allows you to move the helicopter in any of the four directions, forward, back, left, or right, or a mix. You can actually be moving forward and left, for example. The collective controls the pitch of the blades collectively and increases or decreases lift on the rotor system. And your pedals control this little thing over here, the anti-torque, um, the anti-torque, uh, the, the tail rotor, which is the anti-torque little gadget that we have right here. Now, of course, there are other types of helicopters, like, for example, the Chinook, which has two rotor systems, and there are even helicopters with no rotor system or coaxial helicopters, like, for example, the, K the K-MOVs are very well known for that. And we're not going to cover them, but the principle is pretty much the same, and the controls pretty much do the same. So even in a, in a K-MOV, which has no tail rotor, you can actually you can control the pitch. You can control. I'm sorry, the yaw of the helicopter using the pedals. It's a different system. Has to do with the pitch of the rotor systems, um, but that's still how you control the the yaw of the helicopter. Okay, so this was the crash course on how helicopters work, and now you can set up your controls. Okay, just remember throttle. The throttle of the joystick controls the um, the collective of the helicopter. Okay, here we go. It's actually working <laughs> now. Okay, so we have the Bell 429, which is a fever helicopter, and I have my trustworthy um, Thrustmaster T16000, and this is phenomenal, right? <laughs> it's all the sediment of this. And what I'm going to show you today, I'm going to show you something very simple, which is I'm just going to take off do a circuit probably not until the end of the runway just a circuit and land so this is pretty much your first takeoff and landing and i'm going to give you a few pointers as we go first of all let me get inside the cockpit the first thing that i want to give you is whenever you go and this is this this is for explain but it is translates to all the other sims okay so don't don't be turned down by the fact or don't you just be sad or something like that, because this is actually not the sim that you use, but this pretty much ends up uh, translating to the sim that you are using. And what I, what I want, to, want to do here is change the field of view. Okay, so I'm using monitor, of course, or pancake mode, using this tricic, not using my trustworthy um, reverb G2 or anything like that. So I'm going fully pancake mode. I'm going to increase the field of view. Okay, and by increasing the field of view, I have actually more, um, more runway or more scenery in sight, so I can have a better perception of what's happened to the helicopter. Again, it's not the same as VR, but it helps a lot. Um, if you, uh, if you the, the sooner you understand how the helicopter is actually moving, the sooner you'll be able to react to what it's doing in the, um, you know, on the screen. Okay? So, first tip, field of view. Second tip, Try and adjust your settings so that you can get at least 30 frames per second. Okay. If you are if you are using your sim and you have less than 30 frames per second, you are probably lagging behind. What you are seeing on the monitor is not what the actual sim is doing. And you have a hard time controlling the helicopter because you'll always be lagging behind what's happening inside the actual sim. Okay, so there are a couple of these, those are a couple of tips that I wanted to give to you. Okay, so. Third tip, and this is a very, very common mistake. When people start flying helicopters and they start try to start hovering, which is very hard. Okay, so I'm not going, I'm not even going to tell you to start hovering or to hover before I start flying here in what I'm going to demonstrate. I'm going to um, just start flying because this I'm, I'm going to do exactly what I want you to do at home. Okay, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to add any more pressure to you. But one of the things that people start looking, they start looking at the, at, at the, the region, the area near the monitor. And that's a big mistake because you lose a lot of um, periphery vision, peripheral vision, okay? What I wanted to do when you're trying to actually over is to look to the horizon, to look forward away from the helicopter. Let the, your peripheral vision help you and 
in doing your hovering and doing your maneuver. Okay, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to look forward to the end of the runway as I take off and land. Another thing that I want to tell you is that another very common, well, a couple of common mistakes are done by people trying helicopter for the first time. And I have committed both. I actually, all the tips, all the mistakes, everything that I'm telling you here today, I'm guilty of doing them all. Okay, so that's why I know how hard helicopters are and I know where you are and I feel your frustration because I've, I've been there. I've been through that path. And there are two other things that people need to worry about when flying helicopter. One of them, please don't do the same as I did when I first got into the Bell 206. And I was very much used to airliners and GA and I just rank the throttle all the way in 100% and that didn't go well. And if you try to do that on a helicopter, for example, in X-Plane, that's not going to well either. You do not move the throttle all the way. In this case, the throttle, as you know, controls the collective. You are not going to crank it all the way up to take off. You're going to move it very slowly. And I'm going to try and show you that as I go. So you can, you can see that you only need very small amounts of movement for the helicopter to actually start climbing. Okay. Second mistake or second tip with the collective. Once the helicopter gets a bit higher, gets, gets a bit of altitude, and this is going to happen especially in ground, um, in ground effect, is we are, you know, propeller is pushing the air downwards and kind of creates a cushion. So the, it's easier for the helicopter to actually be in that cushion, like a, a, an overcraft. Well, once you get a bit of altitude, just let the collective go. Seriously, just take the hand out of the collective because it's very easy for us to start moving the collective. And the more we start moving the collective, the more torque we are inducing to the system. The more torque we are inducing to the system, the more we need to correct it with pedals. And when we correct it with pedals, we are doing something which I didn't talk earlier, but you should be aware of, is when we are using the pedals, the tail rotor is acting like a propeller. So we are using the pedals and the helicopter is being pushed laterally. And as it is being pushed laterally, we need to compensate using the seat. And, and when you use the seat click, you actually lose a bit of, um, of uh, lift and it tend, the helicopter tends to drop altitude and you are trying to compensate. So it's a mess. So my, my tip is just drop, once the helicopter goes to a certain altitude, very low, very close to the ground, just drop it and just push the cyclic forward, the helicopter will start to gain speed. And as it passes through um, effective translational lift, and this is probably an expression you have never heard before, but you can actually go to helisimmer.com. We have some tutorials where we explain all these, all these expressions. Once it goes past a certain speed, usually around 15 to 20 knots, the rotor disc will gain more lift and the helicopter tends to to, to descend, to, I'm sorry, to ascend. Okay, I'm going to show you all that. I'm trying to give you this explanation beforehand so that you understand what's happening as I go, but I will tell you as I go what I'm going, what I'm doing um, step by step. Okay, so first thing I'm going to grab, as you can see, when I move my, 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 my twist grip, the helicopter wants to yaw, okay? So I have control, I have cycle control and roll control as well, so pitch and roll. I'm going to give it I know that the Bell 429er has a tendency to over with the nose up. So I'm actually pull the, going to pull the, cy the cyclic a bit um, in, in my direction as I increase um, as I increase collective. I'm increasing the collective. Just look at, I'm increasing collective very, very slowly. Okay, you probably, I hope you probably, you, you can see it on the camera. And because, you see what is happening here? Okay, so I'm, I'm very low on this, I'm very light on the speeds now. And I am controlling the nose of the helicopter. And I, I'm not moving. I just, I let the collective go, okay? If I move, if I just let the cyclic settle in, it start, starts move, moving forward because, again, the Bell 429er has a tendency to hover the nose up. And I am controlling that movement with the signal, okay? Now, if I, if I pull a bit more of collective, I am gaining a bit more of altitude, and I am just letting... Okay, I'm letting the collective go. I'm not moving the collective. I'm trying to control the nose of the helicopter using the yaw. Now, the thing that I told you before, 
I am struggling a bit because I am um, I am fighting the spring, the springs, actually more than once. I'm fighting the spring that keeps the twist grip centered, and I'm fighting this the spring that keeps the, the joystick centered. I'm going to keep it just a bit more off collective, just to climb a bit more. Okay, here we are. So I am I am looking at the end of the runway. I'm not looking at the runway near the helicopter. I'm looking at the end of the runway. And now I'm going to push, I'm going to let the nose down a bit, and I'm going to gain a bit of speed. Okay. And if, if you notice, at around 15 or 20 knots, the helicopter tends to pop up. I'm not touching the collector. I'm not adding more forces to the helicopter. I'm not making this harder on myself by putting more forces, more torque into the helicopter. I just drop, I just drop the collector. I just completely let it go, and I'm flying. Okay, as soon as I got some ETL, some effective translational lift, I started flying. Okay, and here we go. I'm just I'm going to turn right here. I'm not going to worry about speeds. I'm not going to worry about altitudes. I just want to fly around and feel comfortable. Okay, that's that's what I want to do. I just want to fly around, feel comfortable, feel the helicopter, just having a good time. Okay, and eventually I'm going back into the airfield. Let me just run here, if I can find the airfield now. Okay, here's the runway. I'm going to fly parallel to the runway. I'm not going to worry myself about flying in the numbers, flying in a certain direction at a certain speed. The only thing, the, the only number that I'm going to get worried about as I approach is the speed when I'm approaching the runway. That's the only thing that I'm going to worry about and of course, I'm going to worry about the fact that when I reduce speed, um, the helicopter will tend to rise because I'm changing the, the lift factor as well. And to prevent that, I'm going to lower the collective a bit, not a lot, just a bit, okay? Let me move, just start to turn into the runway and reduce the collective a bit and start reducing my speed. Okay, again, no need to have a perfect, per, to fly a perfect pattern. I'm going to try and get the speed down to 60 knots. That's the number that I'm trying to find here or achieve or match. Okay, 75, 74, 61, 60. Okay, this is kind of the speed that we want to be at. And I'm not going to try and hover before landing. Okay, I'm going to land with a bit of forward motion, forward speed. Because again, I I don't want to stress out. I don't want to add any more, any more stress or any more pressure to something which is already very difficult for you to do. The sheer fact that you are flying something that probably a new machine for you, especially if you came from fixed wing aircraft, it's, it's really it's hard already. Okay, I'm going to land. Try to land here where all the speed marks are. And reduce speed. So pulling the joystick backwards to reduce speed. 30. I'm going to give it a bit of collective here as I lose transitional lift. And okay, I'm just going to let it settle down and lower the collective. Okay. And that's that's it. That's that was your your first takeoff and your first landing. Again. Like I was selling, I'm going to show you one more time. I just, I'm, I'm raising the collective very slowly. I'm controlling the nose of the aircraft, of the helicopter with my pedals, in this case, with the twist grip. And as soon as it takes off, okay, as soon as it goes, it goes up and climbs a bit, just then give it a bit more here, so that it climbs a bit more. As soon as it does that, I just drop, I just let the, the, the collective go. And then again, a bit of speed. Again, keeping, keeping the nose in the right direction. And off we go. Okay, I'm just going to land here instead of doing the pattern. We just speed 30, 36. Okay, not a free landing, but we survived and we can take off again and again. And again. Okay, so this is, this is, this was my first takeoff and my first land. Now, I want to talk to you about um, 
practice schedule, the practice uh, routine for you to use whenever, whenever you feel like practicing helicopters. Of course, you are more than free and you should be enjoying yourself and using your helicopter in whatever it is that you, what you like to do. But sometimes you want to have a stricter routine for you to practice these things that you want to learn, right? So here are a few pointers. First of all, when you set up your flight, you should set up your flight always on the same, on the same, in the same way. Select an airfield, any airfield, your favorite airfield. Just select an airfield and always start from that airfield from the same place. For example, the runway. I am at uh, Limba Papa, Charlie Sierra, which is Cascais in Portugal, near Lisbon. Okay, runway 35, clear weather. Around 1, 1 p.m., I usually do this at 12 at noon. So, you know, select clear weather so that you don't add more into all the stuff that we're already doing. Time of day, always the same time of day so that you don't, ha you don't have um, differences in the sun, etc. And also, another thing that you should do is go to weights and balances in whatever sim that you are. And for example, you know, always start with 500 pounds and for example, 350 or whatever weight, but always keep the weight and the fuel the same. The goal here is for you to reduce the amount of variables that you are adding into your practice, into your training. Yes, you want to introduce those. And in real life, people actually have to deal with all this stuff. But this is not real life. This is a sim which has a lot of advantages, like, for example, controlling the weather, time of day, your weight, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a lot harder since you don't have the physical feedback to control a helicopter in, in several other conditions. Okay, so keep it as steady and as, as with less variables as you can. Okay, cool. Now that I've given you these tips, let me talk to you about something else that I think you should be doing, or at least give you some pointers. Okay, let me show you drawing. This is the actual airfield that um, I was just flying at. And I want to give you some ideas for your practice sessions. Okay, so for example, we started here at runway 35. Okay. And we have flown um, a pattern. Okay, this is something very simple. You don't actually need to get a specific um, scenery for your practice. You just can do it from whatever airfield that you want. So flying patterns is, a, is good training. Another thing that you can do is, for example, you can take off from whatever runway you are at. You can fly to the other side of the runway, flow flight, uh, low flight, very slow, try to stop here. Do a hover turn, you know, do a 180, and then fly back to where you were, do a 180, and in land, for example. Or you can even adapt to this. Again, start at the beginning of the runway, head out to the first marks, hover, or do a, three, a 360, for example, and then fly to the other mark, hover, and or do another 360 and then fly to the end of the runway, hover 180 and do it again. Or do all this and then take off and do a pattern, you know, hover over here and start over again. Of course, you can also practice using taxiways and using intersections. So you can do everything here. For example, you can hover taxi. You can start from a location and do a hover taxi to the runway, for example, you know. You get here, you do a one way at the 180, and then you start using these marks as um, as goals for you to do some hover turns or something like that. Okay. The thing here is that you can use everything that you already have. You don't need to buy new scenery. You don't have to buy or add new add-ons for you to practice these things because you can actually do it in already using the stuff that we have. Okay. So to, to sum up. So that you guys um, understand what you can do with whatever you have, you only need a, need a sim. Just select the sim that you are more comfortable with, or that you think offers you exactly what you want. Get a good helicopter. It doesn't have to be payware. Get a freeware helicopter. The Bell 429er is a good example um, of a great helicopter, um, but I, I wouldn't advise uh, I wouldn't advise you to use the 429er 
forever in a way for your practice because the Fortunato has something that is very cool, but it, it, it has an issue. It's a very, very stable with a lot of, of aids, of pilot aids. So you are actually not feeling all the forces that you feel in the real, in, the, in another helicopter, like for example, the MD500, okay? So it's okay for you to start with the Fortuniner, just for you to understand how helicopters work, especially if you are really, 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 really new to helicopters, but then move on to a helicopter that gives you, offers you a better challenge, like the MD500, or perhaps get a Bell 206 or a Bell 407 or something like that. Something we know so many hate, okay? You can use a joystick just like the Thrustmaster or any other one. Just keep in mind that the springs will hinder you. You will be always fighting the springs, and that's not good. I actually pulled it off a lot better than I did on my practice sessions with the Bell 429er uh, tonight because I was struggling. I, I have to be honest with you. After many years of using the ProFlight Trainer Puma, which does not have a centering spring. It has a friction system. So I can actually let the cyclic go and it won't fall to the side. Um, after years and years of using the ProFlight Trainer Puma, it was really hard for me to go back to using regular joystick with a spring. So if you can remove the spring, please do it. Do yourself a favor. Same for the pedals, okay? Again, just try to adjust everything that you have and try to be very patient, very persistent and practice, practice, practice. Okay. Well, I think that was all. I, I covered everything. Now, Evan, we're ready for some Q&A here. Oh, yes, yes, we are. I have so, so many questions for you. Lots of wonderful questions and comments from awesome. the chat. So, yeah, it's really excited to do that. And uh, we're going to we might be here for a little while. I hope you've got some time. Uh, lots of really I good have comments. Some time. I have Ollie some time. on the well, Heli Center. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, let me, let me just give you a second because in the middle of all this, um, I forgot to show you guys something. This is a collective. This is a collective from, this is one of the collectives that I have shown before from Verpil. Um, it has, let me just remove it. I just wanted to show you guys how it, how it is, but just let me just remove this. Okay, the head for you guys to see. The, the collective actually works like this. So you control, you control the rotor blades using this axis, but you can also control the throttle using this axis here. I okay, just wanted you guys to actually see one of these live um, and understand a bit more of the controls of helicopters. Okay, sorry, Evan. I am ready for those cool questions. <laughs> no, Bring that's okay. On. That is okay. Um, and I'll keep you on the screen here for a second while I just casually look over on sure. YouTube and see some good comments. But Ollie5050 on helisimmer.com's YouTube says he's great at flying helicopters in the sim because whenever he does, his dad comes by and his dad's a real pilot and he just corrects him. So that would be a nice resource to have. I wish we all had that. Ian Pearson says start with a wheeled helicopter, not skids. Fewer nose crashes, fewer nose overs when you're early landing on a wheeled helicopter. So that makes it a bit easier. Chris from our YouTube channel says he was a Skyly radio DJ, he used to interview Jordan Moore from Hover Control the time and he uh, oh. loved one of those loved those shows loved talking with them he always says the fixed wing airplane they may find you in search and rescue but the helicopter is going to be saving you and exactly. dreams dreams of wings on the helisimmer.com youtube channel goes this is totally inspirational stuff haven't done much with hellos but this makes me want to practice yes that's what we're going for yes. that's exactly Never what we want corrupted. <laughs> so that is awesome that is awesome okay let's get into some questions i'm going to start with flying related questions starting with captain randall fsa captain randall asks does the anti-torque direction that you have in a helicopter is it the same in a normal ga aircraft do you have any use right or left right or the same as you would in the fixed wing airplane or is it different it's different. It depends on the rotation of the engine. If I if I got to if got uh, I understood the the, the, the question yep. correctly, it depends on the direction of the rotor. Uh, usually, uh, American-made uh, helicopters will tend to need left pedal, so they they will um, they will try to the fuselage will try to rotate to the right, and you need the left pedal for you to actually keep the nose um, pointing the way that you want. And European built helicopters, it's the opposite. They tend to, the fuselage tends to go to left and you will need right, um, right um, pedal. Here's a cool tip. You, if you are going to get into the helicopter, 
you very probably already know the direction in which the nose will try to point because, you know, you'll probably study a bit of the helicopter beforehand. But if you are like me and you change helicopters every now and then, and um, again, like I said, usually the U.S. helicopters tend to rotate in one, in one direction, so you need left pedal. So they, they tend to rotate to the right and the left, and the Europeans are the opposite. But a very quick tip for you to understand um, in which direction the fuselage will will tend to will tend to rotate. If you look, if you are inside the cockpit and if you see the the rotor going from left to right, you are going to need right pedal. If it goes from the right to left, you're going to need left pedal. That's a very quick way for you to understand what pedal you are going to need. Of course, if you raise the collective, you'll, you'll feel the helicopter um, go in that direction. But if you know which, in which direction it's going, to, um, it's going to rotate beforehand, you can actually be a bit ahead of the helicopter and not be in so much trouble. Perfect. Also relating to flying helicopters, still on the HaleySimmer.com YouTube channel, Dilor1 is a question about if you're not using the runway, but if there's a helipad at the airport, how do you deal with the traffic pattern and follow the taxiways and make your approach when you're not going to a runway, but instead you're going to a helipad? That depends on the that depends on the on the airport. That depends on the airfield and depends on the ATC. You somewhat are you sometimes are sent directly to the helipad. You sometimes have to actually um, approach from different uh, from different directions. Some heli some airports actually have routes, especially for helicopters, uh, so that they can approach those helipads. It is completely dependent on on the airfield. Perfect. Thank you for that. I'm just I'm trying to get my myself on the screen, but I I can't turn away from the chat on the HeliSimmer YouTube channels. I've got to reconfigure in the background here, uh, but lots of questions still to come. So now we're talking about simulators and dangerous subject maybe, but the VR pilot off of your YouTube channel wants to know which simulators allow shared cockpit and shared flight controls for helicopters specifically. Oh, I wish, I wish. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have native support for shared cockpits and shared controls. There, There's an add-on. Um, I don't remember the name, to be honest. There's an add-on for X-Plane that allows you to do that, but you need to have some configuration files done for the helicopters. I have tried with the Dreamfall Creations Bell 407 and one of the readers of, um, of uh, Helicim, one of our, our friends, actually, Carol, uh, which is also a moderator for, uh, for our forums and for our group. And I actually tried it and it works very, very well. But it's not something that it's available for all, hel all helicopters because you do need to have a lot of work doing the config files. Unfortunately, it's not available yet. I know, we know that Microsoft has talked about doing it for Microsoft Flight Simulator back in 2019 when I was at the world premiere event and I talked to the team there. I, I specifically talked to them about the fact that we need tools to teach other simmers fly not only helicopters, but fly to use the sim, right? And um, shared cockpit was on one of them, but we also need other things like, for example, the ability for you to point to instruments, for example, or to point outside the world or something like that. So we do need to, tools to teach other people, and, but we don't have them yet. Excellent. And I'm getting, so I finally got my screen set up because you guys are too good on the chat. There's so many messages that I finally, I got it set up. So now I can watch everything. Uh, so Charles, FSA captain, says that for X-Plane 11, you can use something called Smart Copilot. I don't know if you know about exactly. that. Yeah. yeah um, that's, so that's, that's what he's saying. Yeah. And then Albert, an FSA first officer, says the DCS Huey has shared cockpit and he used it to teach his brother, he says. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's all. Oh. Oh, I, I completely forgot that. Yes, DCS just recently added that. Not just shared copy. Oh, uh, how did I forget that? <laughs> not just not just shared copy. You can actually get four people inside a helicopter. I did that with the uh, Belgiodes and uh, Joe, guy from our group as well, and a friend of mine, Pedro, and we had a blast. We had a real blast with uh, with the DCS with the DCS UE. I'm really sorry. I, f I totally forgot about it. Yeah, That's okay. The, yes, guys. The Use chat is all really over. Nice. They have you covered. They are they're awesome today. Awesome. So they've Thank got you, you guys. Covered. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be a tough old. one for you. Dreams of Wings. He wants to know, is X-Plane the best for rotary physics? Or in your opinion, anyway, what's the best physics for helicopter flight simulation? Well, I did mention Aerofly FS2. And the R22 of Aerofly FS2, it's absolutely amazing. It, um, I know a lot of a lot of pilots that fly the R-22. I'm just talking about a helicopter in specific, but I'll go back to the broader spectrum, to the broader thing, okay? 
The R22 is very good. I know a lot of helicopter of real R22 pilots that find it amazing. That R22 was actually developed by Apex with the help of Claude Vouchard, which if some of you guys know, is the inventor of the Vouchard maneuver to get out of Vortex ring state. He's a very well-known pilot. He has been working tirelessly uh, towards increasing safety in, in helicopters and helicopter flying. And he did an excellent job with the IPEX team to do, to do that flight model. So it's absolutely fantastic. Um, not only Aeroflight Festival, but of course, DCS and X-Plane, those are, for me, the best sims in terms of flight dynamics. Just keep in mind, and I know that I'm going to piss a lot of people off, but keep in mind that if all of them have flaws, okay, and even DCS, which is very good, there's something that you guys should know or should be aware is that it's very easy to get into vortex ring state in all the helicopters in DCS and when it shouldn't happen like that in real life. Okay, that's the the major caveat or the major issue with DCS helicopters. Having that said, they are absolutely amazing. So either X-Plane 11 or DCS, or if you want to try a really good R22, Aerofly Festive. Perfect. Sandra on Facebook says she has to go, but big thank you for being here. So thank you, Sandra. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Sandra. Moving into some questions on hardware now from FSA First Officer Daniel. Uh, he says, why are there no affordable cyclics or collectives? Everything seems to be either a mod of a cheap joystick or it costs a fortune. What's the deal with that? Yeah, um, that's that's a question. That's a good, that's an excellent question. All, all the questions are good, but that's an excellent question because it, it shows the problem that we have with the helicopter flight simulation community. We are an issue inside an issue. Okay? We, we, there, there are not a lot of helicopter flight simmers out there. And what it does is that it makes the manufacturing of hardware really expensive because we, the developers are, are, are not going to be able to manufacture a lot of hardware because there's not a lot of people to buy it. So you, you, you cannot actually play with the numbers. You know, the more, the more you build, the cheaper they are. It's, it's, it's like that everywhere. And unfortunately with helicopters, we don't have the enough numbers to make that happen. Um, and the, Sometimes I, I see these discussions rise and I see people getting real upset at the developers. And I know I know a few developers, a few manufacturers, especially independent man manufacturers that have been struggling with keeping their prices as low as possible. Um, but it's it's still, it's, it's very hard because all this takes a lot of time for them to build. It takes a lot of money for them to get good parts. We don't want like we don't want stuff to break on our hands, so we need quality quality material. But it is right now it is a numbers thing. They are not they are never going to sell as many collectives as they are selling yokes, right? So that's that's one of the major issues that we have numbers. And even like just civil uh, fixed wing hardware, it hasn't you haven't really seen like mass production and prices coming down until recently. Like until Honeycomb and Thrustmasters really stepped up like in the last three or four years. You go back before that, there was like nothing. It was like you had, you know, sort of cheap plastic stuff or you had like super high end stuff, similar kind of thing. So maybe you guys can can do the same thing. Maybe you're gonna start something with this webinar, Sergio, and we'll we'll change the yeah, world. Well, uh yeah, well, I'm, I'm trying to, and I, I know I Microsoft. Know. Flight I know Microsoft Soft Flight Simulator has has been helping a lot as well. Because you, you, I don't know the numbers right now, but back in December or something, actually back in December, not 2021, in December 2020, I think they had like three million users. Yeah, I know. Of it's, Microsoft it's Flight insane. Simulator. The numbers is great. So I, I know that Microsoft Flight Simulator is helping in that regard. It's bringing more people into the hobby and more people that are going to spend more money. Um, into flight sim, I think the the last predictions were something like uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator would would get people to buy about four point five billion dollars in hardware. Wow! So uh, yeah, I, I think that will help, and yeah. it will help even more when Microsoft uh, finally uh, adds um, native support for helicopters, which will happen later this year. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, continuing on the subject of hardware, Sean, just a moment ago on the, on the YouTube channel, says, what brand of flight controls, collective, and pedals were you just showing? Can you remind us all, please? Yeah, it was the Pro Flight Trainer Puma X, which is the fifth generation. The one that I use, it's the fifth, the last, the latest generation of the Pro Flight Trainer Puma, which uh, is actually a Canadian company, um, but they have, they have also support here in Europe, in Switzerland. And... Uh, it's an amazing, it's an amazing kit. We have, um, we have a review 
full review done by Joe Hudson, um, a U.S. Army Apache instructor pilot for the fourth generation. I have done also a kind of a review, which it not a review, but I kind of show the differences between generation four and generation five, which is the current one. And I hopefully uh, will convince Joe Hudson. Uh, I, I'm not throwing Joe into the bus, uh, under the bus, um, but I hopefully will eventually get Joe to take a look at the fifth generation as well and let us know what he thinks as a pilot. It's a great unit. I love it. And I'm trying to get them to come to Flight Sim Expo. They were thinking about it in 2021, so fingers crossed we see them at our next show. And now you've started the rumor because the VR pilot is saying, if Honeycomb creates a helicopter throttle, oh my god. So just so you know, you're the responsible for creating that rumor. Uh, but David McGrath, helisimmer.com YouTube channel, wants to know what kind of PC desk you have. He says his doesn't leave much space for a six-foot person to use pedals. Hmm. Or any the recommendations? Desk? The desk it, is talking about, you in. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it, it, it depends. You, you do have smaller pedals. Um, well, it, it depends. The ProFlight Trainer, actually, I'm not sponsored by, I'm not here to sponsor ProFlight Trainer, but I'm just, I'm just, just so that you guys know, the ProFlight, the, the problem is that where is it that you are going to keep the ProFlight Trainer Puma when you're not using it? That's the problem. But when you are using it, despite having all the different controls, it doesn't take that much space, even under the desk, right? The pedal, it's just, we're talking about, um, it's, it's hard for me, I, I cannot show you, but we're talking about um, a small small piece of metal, long metal with the pedals on, on, on at the tip. So it's probably something like, I don't know, um, 40 centimeters or something like that, wide. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not very big. For bigger pedals, it's going to be a problem. Yeah, I, I don't have a solution for that. Yeah. That's definitely a tough one. Um, well, we'll keep on pedals, then. I'll give you a chance to ask another or to answer another pedals question, which is: Can you control? Well, this is an easy one for you, at least. Uh, can you control tail rotor with normal fixed wing rudder pedals from FSA Captain William? Yeah, definitely, definitely, you can. Again, you will struggle with the spring if you have a control set that you can remove the spring or at least change it to a weaker spring. That's ideal because you will have a lot more control. A lot of more fine control over the over the pedals because everything in the in the helicopter is very sensitive, right? You you just you just saw my demonstration. I just give it gave it a little bit of collective, and the helicopter went up. You guys were watching my. I wasn't yanking the joystick um, to control the helicopter. I was making very smooth and small movements. So you need the small movements. And if you have a spring and you are fighting the spring, what's going to happen is that you are either going to over control by you know adding more force and eventually you wait, things go uh, past the point that you need, or are you going to under control because you are struggling and making for, and, you know, adding pressure and more and more and more and more. And you'll just need that little bit of movement, but it's very hard for you because you are fighting the spring. That's the thing. But yes, you can use regular rudder pedals for fixed wing for helicopters. You'll just have, you'll just struggle a bit more. Awesome, and thank you, Will, for watching from California. The VR pilot on the helisimmer.com YouTube says, great stream, let's hit that thumbs up button. Thank you, thank you, yes, do hit the thumbs thank up button. Thank you very much, Jose. Subscribe, and uh, hey, come on over to Flight Sim Association as well and create a free account while you're at it, why not? Uh, Paul, FSA First Officer, wants to know, what anti-torque pedals do you recommend? I love, I, uh, if you guys uh, check it out on uh, on my website on helsinger.com, I have done a review on the Verpal pedals and they are absolutely amazing. They are amazing because they are very well built, they are very precise, and you can remove the spring. And not only that, not only that, but there's a guy in Russia called Mikhail, known in the community as K51. And Mikhail has actually done very affordable collective, which we have also reviewed on our website. But Mikhail did something very cool, which is um, a kind of a friction system for the Verpal pedals. I have reviewed that as well. It's on the website. So you can remove the spring, you can add this friction system, and you gain even more control over the pedals because it, the pedal won't just won't, won't be loose, right? You have a bit, a bit of, you have to do a bit of pressure, but it's very, very comfort, comfortable and very, very controllable. It's just amazing. If you get verbal pedals and you get Mikhail's mod, and look, Mikhail's mod costs 20 euros. It's a no-brainer, really. If you don't like it, you just lost 20 euros, but I, you probably, you very probably like it. 
just remove the spring of the pedal, assemble the mod. It's very easy to assemble, and you're all set. Well, that's that's my recommendation. Yeah, the vertical pedals, any 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 of their models, because the the, stru the main structure is the same. They just vary a bit on the actual pedals themselves, but the the the, the frame and the actual base is all the same. And, and get Mikhail's mod. It's well worth. Very good. So I have two questions here, and they're perfect follow-up for each other. So it's like he was watching the presentation. Uh, Dennis, the fellow Canadian, hello, nice to see you. He's in Arizona, which I'm Maybe. sure is way nicer than where I am as I look outside of a snowstorm again. Uh, so he says, I always struggle with controlling helicopters using the Logitech Extreme 3D Pro. I can never seem to find the sweet spot. What do I need to do? And he asked this question before you gave him the answer, but let's give him the answer again. And then he has a follow-up that he doesn't even know he asked a follow-up. It was perfect. <laughs> well, um... Hello again. Uh, the first thing I have to say is that, yeah, you are fighting the spring. And that's, that's, that's the problem, okay? And the other thing that you need to be aware is that all helicopters are different. And the sweet spot or that center or that, you know, neutral zone of the helicopter can actually depend on a lot of different things. And just the sheer fact that you are adding collective and having to input pedal, that is shifting, okay? That center, that that center point, that neutral point that you are finding, that all they're trying to find, is going to be shift. And that's the, that's one of the things and one of the problems with helicopters. And people who usually don't understand that they are very. It's it, it's actually the same thing with fixed wing aircraft. Okay, you have the aircraft trimmed, so it's flying nice and steady. But if you are if you have throttle, you have to retrim it. it. You are not going to retrim it on the helicopter. Well, you can, but let's just forget that trim exists. But whatever is it that you do with helicopters, you will have to adjust, you will have to adapt to what the helicopter is doing. That's one. That's why I told you not to keep your hand on the collective and, and going back, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down, because you're going to be struggling with yourself. It's bad enough for you to actually have to struggle with the with the springs of the of the joystick if you have them. But if you are adding the, the, the fact that you are fighting with the forces that the helicopter is causing and the forces that actually physics uh, are causing on the helicopter, you are putting yourself into trouble. Don't try to find that center or that sweet spot of the helicopter and, believe, and with the conviction that, okay, this is it, and this is going to be it forever. If there's, going, if there's wind, even wind, if there's wind, if you adjust the collective a bit, if you give it a, a bit more of a pedal, because you can, you can have you can have the helicopter all set up, hovering under one way, rock steady, and then a little bit of of uh, side wind comes up, and you know it it hits the tail rotor or it hits the the vertical stabilizer, and the, you yaw a bit, and you give you have to give it a bit more of pedal, and you'll need to to find that center again, that sweet spot again, for you to be able to continue hovering. You won't. You won't have when you when you hover, and that's something that some sometimes people will struggle to understand. When you are hovering, your stick is not stopped. Your hand is not stopped. You are not you're not rock. You're not just holding the stick. You are continuing to actually move the stick because you are trying to get the helicopter to be um, steady the whole time. And the helicopter will want to do different things. If you let go of the joystick, you lose control of the helicopter. So please don't push yourself into trying to find that sweet spot because that sweet spot depends on a lot of variables. Yeah, and Rangoon on the YouTube channel says the exact same thing. The neutral point, it can change from day to day, beginning of the flight to the end of the flight. So uh, Dennis asked a perfect follow-up question for this because he says, do you have any recommendations for joysticks that are easy to disable the spring? Yeah, um, the, joy the, 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 the joystick that I see a lot of people use and I, I actually recommend um, are either the the the, a, the former Statac, which is not Logitech, you know, the X55, X56, X52, if you can find it on the market. The image that I showed before, it's my 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 good old X45. So on the X56, I think you can actually really remove the grip and the springs or replace the springs. That's a perfect one. If you cannot remove the springs, just use a zip tie and just compress it. Or you can um, use the Verpal ones. Again, I have reviews of the Verpal. I have reviews of pretty much all the different sets from Verpal, the different controls from Verpal. Um, and all of them are done in the perspective of a helicopter pilot. So I tell you exactly what I've done in them with the, those controls to make them more helicopter friendly. Again, just keep in mind, when you remove the spring, 
the joystick will just fall to the side. But trust me, it is worth it. It is worth it. And you won't need that centering spring anyway because helicopters don't have a center per se. Which I, I, I just covered that, right? So um, the less you have to struggle against the spring, the better. Check out either Logitech or Verpil. I am in love with the Verpil hardware. The quality is just fantastic, guys. Really. And Ollie agrees on YouTube saying that the most most joysticks are easy to disassemble. Just remove the spring. It's an easy thing to do. Um, you're probably going to void your warranty, so be careful with that. But, you know, it shouldn't be that hard to do. And Bell Geode says, Logitech X52, I can vouch for it. Served me well for many years. And that Zip Try tricks work, trick works really well as well. And he's also continuing to say uh, he's using the verbal Tomcat stick right now. Very precise, even for helicopters. Uh, Mike, yeah. FSA Captain Mike, thanks for the support. Asking, do you have any comments on the map? Max flight stick controls. Uh, I don't have any comments. I, I unfortunately never use Max flight stick controls. Um, I have seen some comments and some remarks um, on some of the Facebook groups. Some guys are happy with it. Some guys are not. I have no experience with them, so I, I, I can actually talk about it or vouch or anything. As my experience with them is actually it, it's zero really. I have I've had some contact with them. They seem nice, but other than that, I. I, I never use their controls. Yeah. If only these people would come to this show called Flights and Expo, where we bring all of these simmers together to demonstrate their products, yeah. right? Yeah. Ian's saying, yeah. Uh, you know, he he went out to, or no, sorry, the VR pilot is saying he went out to Ayitzik in 2021. That's a great show. I was there in 2019, the world's largest military modeling flight simulation show. And that's actually where I also flew that uh, product that you've told me about many times from Ryan Aerospace with VR where you're sitting in the chair and you've got everything and that was a really cool experience for sure. Uh, lots more questions coming in so I'll just keep going. I'm sort of moving now into more of the sim software kind of different helicopter types. Uh, Delore one on YouTube wanted to know how does the modeling work of handling turbine versus internal combustion engines, is that stuff simulated and can you really tell the difference in simulators? Yeah, you can tell the difference of some of the models. Um, it, it, it depends on the helicopter and how the developer actually actually did it. Um, it's not it's not something that a lot of people look for um, when flying helicopters in sims. Um, but some of the some of the models out there do that. Yeah, they model it. FSA first officer Paul wants to know if he wants to specifically fly the Bell two hundred six. Which flight simulation platform would be the best for that? Well, there's not a lot of Bell 206s out there. Um, old guy, old timers like myself remember the Dodo sim for FSX, which is pretty good. FSX in general is not a good sim for um, for helicopters. As the flight model is really bad. But the Dodo sim F, uh, 206 for FSX was absolutely incredible. And nowadays, more recently, we have a 206 from um, Joshua Cohen, uh, which has a company called Cohen Simulation, and he, re he very recently released a 206. And he's watching, an by the way. He's commenting along on our Facebook channel. If it's the oh, same awesome. person, hey, Joshua. I think, he's there. I think he's there. Awesome. Oh, hey, Joshua. Nice, nice having you here. Um, and his 206 is absolutely fantastic. We have a review on the 206 done by a real pilot, and it's an absolutely fantastic helicopter. I highly recommend it. Perfect. Um, I, I'm getting so many questions here. I'm trying to keep up with you guys. I'm getting questions answering other people's questions, which is awesome. So this one is from Bill, who says, for the person asking about a desk, and this is really good advice. I've been hearing this all the time. Look into the adjustable desks, like the ones that can go up and down. Those are really popular now, and you can like turn them into a standing desk or a low desk. He says he picked one up on Amazon for like 250 bucks, and he put the desk height up high enough so he can sit comfortably and use the rudder pedals without banging his knees. And I keep like five or six people have just mentioned those forget which website it is but i have to reach out to them for an fsa discount so there's a good uh, piece of advice back to you david uh tackleberry on youtube talking about uh, the apache on eagle dynamics and he's wondering if you have any insight is it getting released next week or is it getting postponed no i have no idea well as, as far as ed told us yesterday or the day yeah it was yesterday it is getting delayed it is getting delayed they they, they keep saying it's uh, first quarter 2022 they are trying to release it on February. I have no inside information. All I know is from what we are getting. Um, we'll just have to be patient. Software development is not easy, guys. We'll just have to wait. 
Fair enough. And Joshua Cowan is here, by the way. He just said hi again. So thank you. Hey. Hello. Uh, all right. We're talking now about motion platforms. Do you have any uh, recommendations, commentary on motion platforms and motion bases, specifically for helicopters? Uh, yeah. Well, um, that, that that's a that's a tricky subject. Actually, it's very it's very curious and very funny because it's very interesting. Um, but you do need to be aware. I don't have any recommendations because I haven't. I have tried one. I have tried, and I, I will tell you about the one that I've tried in a second. But those motion, there are a couple of good manufacturers out there that make good good motion platforms. Um, any of them works. But you need to be aware of something, which is, it is a lot of fun. This is my this is my personal perspective, and I will tell you the experience that I had with the other one. Um, from my personal perspective, from trying a motion platform in, I think it wasn't in one, I think it was in the 2019 FlySim Expo, I mean, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. It's nice, it's cool, but it, I, I don't think it's a, it's a, for me, it's not an investment that it, it would be worth making it. Yeah, um, I, remember, I tried that one as well. I think, I forget, I'm trying to remember the name of the company now. They were with IL2, right? Was um, it with that booth? I, I think, think it was I with think, that booth. I don't, re I actually don't remember. I'm yeah, sorry, okay. I don't remember. But the I, one I would, that I did try yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was Sorry. gonna say I, I sort of felt the same thing. Like we use a full motion simulator at work to simulate the Embraer 175, and quite often the instructor will just turn off the motion, and we don't know. Like because there's the wraparound and sort of the full effect, you know, you can kind of tell, but you really don't notice the motion. And if you have a VR headset on and you're at your home like controls, I mean, no doubt it's different, right? Like you can obviously feel if you're in a chair and the chair's going yeah. like this. But I don't know that if I was like going to make that investment, I would say yeah, it's like a hundred percent worth it for me. But if it was anything, it would probably be helicopters because I feel like there's there's a lot more motion than like your average fixed wing takeoff and landing. That, that that's the thing. That's a yeah. That that that's the thing. And I'm going to tell you about the other the experience that I had with a with a motion with a um, motion platform that it was that was real was really good was really nice. But the, here's the thing: it's not just about the platform; it's also about the software. The things have to work very well in conjunction. Yeah. And the platform that I tried that was really nice. It was a prototype. For um, for a platform that is, it was actually very recently certified in Europe from by a company by a Swiss company called VR Motion, and they invited me back in 2018 to check out the prototype that they in which they were working, and they were working in this prototype with again Claude Vouchard. and they are working with they are using Aerofly FS2, a version of Aerofly FS2 by IPEX. so the R22. That we have on on the on the Aerofly FS2 um, sim actually comes from this joint venture between IPEX, VRM, and Mr. Claude Vouchard. That's where the R22 comes from, and it, it was used by on on by VRM on that platform. And that platform was custom built with a lot of patent of patents behind it. Um, it was very it was being um, connected to the sim in very specific ways. And they didn't have just the software and the hardware, but they had physiologists working with them to actually trick the inner ear and the liquids inside the inner ear for you to actually feel like you were being moved, moved around exactly the same way that you were seeing inside the sim. Because if you translate the motions on a motion platform one by one to one, you may not feel exactly what you are watching on the screen, and it can cause it can cause nausea. I can tell you, I was really, really impressed with that platform and the result. I, I immediately, it, it just made me a better virtual pilot just by the fact that I was feeling that motion. Okay, but I didn't feel that same that same uh, difference on other on another that other platform motion that I used. It wasn't the same. And one of the things that I, I usually struggle when, when I started using VR was in, although, I, like I said, depth perception is a lot better, you are moving from a system, from a 2D system to a VR system, and there are differences. I remember when I was with them back in 2018, there was a commercial pilot um, next to me as I was trying the platform. And I, I tried the platform before using VR, just a platform with a monitor. And I, did, I just took off uh, with the helicopter and landed when I wanted. And the, the instructor, the, the guy that was with me, the commercial pilot, real commercial pilot, was asking me uh, how how you know how, how the hell how the hell did he do that? And I was like, how the hell did I do what? How the hell did he just land like that? Because 
it's impossible for me to land on it using a 2D monitor. And I, I just told him, well, you're a pilot, right? It's impossible for me to actually fly a real helicopter and do it. You've been doing it for years. I've been flying using 2D monitors for years. I am more than used to using the 2D monitors and to try and understand the distances. So when I moved to VR and uh, when I tried that platform, it was very early for me. I had the problem with um, trying to understand the distances because it was different from a monitor. And I, 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 I tended to stop or to hover before my target a spot where I wanted to land. And I actually felt that the helicopter was stopping before my eyes saw it on the VR world. And when I started to feel the helicopter the, the, losing speed with my body as the platform was doing it, I corrected it. And instead of stopping short of the target, I just nailed the landing. And it was the first time that I used a platform using VR. And not bragging, but the guys just you know started applauding and uh, cheering because it was the first time using the platform. And I just nailed, um, I just nailed the the landing. But the thing is. 80% of the credit of that landing was the platform. So I do believe motion platforms do work very well, but I think there's a lot of work behind both software and hardware and the integration and not just mimicking one-to-one -one movements from the sim to the platform, but something else. Whatever VRM is doing, they are doing. And again, I'm not doing any... I'm not here to to do any kind of advertising. I'm just talking about the technologies that I've been... I've been um, getting in touch with and it's just fantastic whatever they are doing it's just it's amazing i was very impressed yeah and that's that babbling that's not, that's, that's okay uh that stuff is getting cheaper as well like we had at flights maxpo 2021 which you wouldn't have been able to come to yaw vr has this really cool chair someone just mentioned it in the chat and that system is like a couple hundred bucks and you literally have like a, a very small like it looks like a regular gaming chair and the whole thing moves and so you can actually in vr you can have that experience and i guess it would work just as well with helicopters and fixed wing and really anything uh, so yeah. that's a really cool to, company yeah. to i would keep love to try eye. it i would love to try that one yeah perhaps yeah. they'll be on the next on the next uh, flight Expo. i think they will yeah. yeah, yeah. They nice. said they had a great time, so I think I'm sure they will be there. Um, lots of people talking about the butt kicker as well. Where since we're talking about motion, Mike FSA Captain mentioned that. Drew brought that up as well up in the YouTube chat. So, um, firstly, have you heard of? I have never heard about this. A feel belt. Have you ever heard of a feel belt? No, I haven't. No. I never. I never, never heard that. I never but heard of, talk about the no, butt kicker no though, and maybe tell people a bit about that. Oh, but um, the butt kicker is uh, a device that you attach to the chair and uh, you connect um, your sound card to it and it just, it gets the sound from the sim and it translates to vibration to your chair. And it, it, it works. There are other solutions, different solutions out there. Um, I don't remember the name of this solution, which is actually a chair. We, we have done a review, but uh, it just miss. Uh, I don't remember what the name it is. Of the of the platform, but there there's uh, I, I'll actually add to the to the on the comment on our on our video um, once I check it. But it goes beyond that. It does not just use sounds. Depending on the sim, and for example, DCS is supported. It actually gets data from the sim. So for example, even if it's not heard, but you you land and you touch the skid on the on the runway, it actually gives you feedback. And it's not just a single. Um, a single little thing that you attach to a chair. It's uh, you put it on the chair. It's like a cover, and it has six or eight uh, little vibration pads, so you can actually feel the different motion from you know from the left or from the right or on your butt, on your back or something like that. It adds. It really adds up to the immersion in VR. Is Definitely. That jet pad. Yeah, jet pad. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. Thank Thanks you, thank you, FSA yeah. Captain Will. Good, thank you for paying attention and for answering this. Thank you very um, much. And I apologize, I'm, I'm kind of moving around here because there are so many chats and there are so many different places that I have to watch. And I'm running out of screen real estate, so I'm trying to keep up with everybody <laughs> here. And lots of good <laughs> questions. Uh, we're awesome. on the topic of virtual reality. John wants to know what virtual reality headset do you recommend? Hmm, I am using the Reverb G2. Um, yeah. and, and you're using the most popular one, by the way, according to the Navigraph survey that just came out. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and, and for and for a reason, it's a very good it's a very good device. There are other devices out there with um, higher capacity, high resolution, but I've seen I've seen a lot of comments and people mean mixed feelings. Um, it worked very well for some; it didn't work that well for others. 
The G2 is working very nicely for me. I love the G2. I use it a lot. I use it all the time when I do VR. I not, not always do VR because of um, of stuff that I need to record, etc. or take screenshots. So it's it's a lot easier to do it on to do on pancake mode, like people like this call it. But my recommendation is probably the Reverb G2. Or if you are if you have issues with your um, with your budget, um, perhaps uh, an Oculus. It's just it's absolutely amazing as well. I know the Vario Aereo is out there, but it's really expensive. And if I have no experience with it, I would like to give it a try. I would like to um, try it out and, and review it, but I have no information on that. Still, it's a, it's a bit of a, an expensive device. My recommendation right now, yeah, get a G2. Yeah, those guys at Vario, actually, they have an FSA captain discount. So, I mean, you're right, it's crazy expensive. They have, like, 10% off. So you save, like, 700 bucks. I mean, if you're thinking about buying that thing, uh, we have, you know, for $3 a month, when you buy your captain subscription, you can save $700 on a headset. So that's cool. But, yeah, definitely at the higher end of the spectrum. And I'm sure that prices are going to keep coming down on all of those things as they yeah. get more popular and I, we're seeing development. I think I actually think the, the Aero is cheaper. It's something like... Three uh, two thousand or something like that. Two or yeah, three something K, like that. It's that. but it's a lot. Yeah. Like it was just struck me yeah, as being a lot. like yeah, you know a lot. lot. Yeah, and I think even, there's a few the, different versions. The, so. Yeah, Sorry, even the G two to be even the G two to be honest is a bit expensive. Um, but yeah, it's worth it. It's worth it. Yeah. Uh, okay. And I'm surprised this name hasn't come up, but we've talked. Uh, there's some comments in the chat about Helicopter, Total Realism, and Fred Nar. And uh, forget. Sorry, I apologize. Forget the name of who asked this, but the question was: Is Fred involved in Microsoft Flight Simulator's coming Helicopter Flight Modeling, or has he done anything with MSFS? Um, no. Uh, Fred did release Herland FS, which is an external module exactly like HDR for uh, Microsoft for FSX. And he has released Airland FS for Microsoft Flight Simulator. A lot of the freeware helicopters that we have in the market right now are thanks to Fred Nar. So basically, Airland FS is pretty much HDR, the next evolution of HDR for Microsoft Flight Simulator. But he is not, at least as far as I know, um, and I have been talking to Fred quite a lot, but Fred has not been involved with uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. Gotcha. Okay, going back a little bit to VR, uh, John, sorry, Nino off of the YouTube channel is wondering, are there VR goggles that support hand tracking as well? Uh, the ones that I know, there are some solutions that work with uh, regular trackers um, or regular headsets. I have tried a few. Um, I, have, I have actually reviewed one for Sensory X. They are not, again, they are not cheap. Actual um, headsets that have native uh, hand recognition. Again, I think Vario has them, but Vario is again very, really expensive, and it's uh, it's a professional thing, not natively. Except Vario is the only brand that I can remember. Of. Very good. I think we may finally be getting close to the end of my list of questions here. Lots of good stuff today, so thank you guys. Any last questions? Now is a good time to send those in. Uh, a couple follow-ups on the virtual reality conversation. FSA Captain Mike, he says that he's used the Pimax 8K, HPG2, Quest 2, and the Index, and he says that for the ability to read instruments, the reverb is best, and for the field of view, the Pimax. So there's some mm -hmm. commentary from him. Uh, another comment is I crane my neck over this way to look at another monitor from Chris on our YouTube channel says he has the Gamer 2 butt kicker. Very cool. Adds a higher level of the sim, or sorry, to the sim, I should say, especially the way it simulates the blade slap. That works really well for helicopters, he says. So lots of, oh, really cool, yeah. lots of comments above uh, all, all over the place. Last couple of questions. Anybody? Uh, one from Josh on helisimmer.com's YouTube channel wondering about if you've tested the uh, Vario Aero yourself no i haven't no i haven't i was just mentioning that um a few minutes ago i haven't tried i haven't tried it i haven't tested it i would love to if anyone from Hario is watching this which i really doubt um I'm <laughs> open to reviewing it Yes, hint, hint, exactly. And Mike is saying with hand recognition, going back to that question we asked a few minutes ago, that of course needs support from the simulator. And he's saying X-Plane doesn't simulate that. I think P3D does. I feel like Microsoft Flight Sim does, but I guess not X-Plane. Um, not that I know of. I know that uh, Sensory X was trying to get uh, X-Plane to work or to let me know research look into it. I know they did it with the Eagle Dynamics and DCS. So he does work natively with DCS, not X-Plane. Perfect. I think 
I think we may have gotten finally to the end of all these questions. That was wonderful. Thank you to the chat. Lots of awesome stuff. Uh, Sergio, maybe you can just sort of wrap up here and tell people and remind people who may not know, where can they find you? Where can they find more information on this stuff? And most importantly, you know, we, as you and I both know, it's so important to support content creators and people like you who aren't doing this necessarily full time, certainly aren't doing it for the money. You're doing it to help just increase awareness of this really cool thing. So if people wanted to support that mission, support the cost of running your website, how would they find you and how would they do all that? Well, they can find us. Th thank you very much, Evan. They can find us at hallysimmer.com and they can actually support us through Patreon at patreon.com forward slash hallysimmer. And we have very recently, just only a few days ago, uh, kind of then of a soft launch of memberships on YouTube. So we are mimicking the same uh, perks and the same tiers that we have at, uh, on Patreon because some of the guys some people asked us to offer an alternative to Patreon since they don't like the platform. So we're doing that on uh, on the YouTube channel. Actually, you can you can just join as a member for a small fee, even as low as one dollar ninety nine, something like that. Thirty percent, seventy percent goes to us. Thirty percent goes to YouTube. Um, every single cent of uh, what we make goes into the, into the project, either be it server costs, even hardware, um, travel costs sometimes, for example, to attend Flight Sim Expo and stuff like that. Everything else, guys. Uh, it's not mandatory, of course. All our content is out there free of charge. We do have also uh, some tutorials and a section just for you to learn how to fly helicopters. It's right there on the top of the screen when you hit when you enter helicimmer.com. And that's pretty much it. We may be open to other kinds of support systems, but right now, these are the two that we have. Perfect. And one more uh, question just came in from uh, FSA First Officer Chris Palmer, just under the wire here. How would you compare Verpool versus Puma if you had to compare those two manufacturers and their controls, if, if you can even do that? Uh, that's that's really hard. That's really hard to compare. Um, it's it's, it's two, different, two different control systems. They are both, especially with the fifth generation, they are both very precise. And it's just a matter of what is it that you are looking for yourself. I like the Puma because it's a compact unit and it has everything. I don't need to mod anything. You know, you just get it from the from the from the manufacturer. You assemble it because it comes it's assembled inside a inside a box. I I show that on the on the article I wrote making the comparison between generation four and generation five. It actually comes in a box, you assemble it, and it's it's ready to go. You don't need to to tune anything. You can actually tune by uh, adding or removing friction. Because it is a control set that's meant for helicopters, just like the collective for verb, something done specifically for helicopters, and you can tune the friction. I have been in touch with Verpil. I have been trying to convince them to, uh, if not doing something specific for helicopters, and I understand that it's very hard to any company to do something very specific for helicopters because it is a small market. I am very, actually, very happy and very surprised that Verpil got into the helicopter market via the, the collectives. Uh, but um, something that I would like, not just for Verpal, but for any manufacturer out there that makes joysticks, I would like them to provide us with a way for us to remove the spring, but have a friction system somehow, even if it was something that we would have to buy separately, but having a friction system so that the joystick doesn't fall to the side and we can just leave it there. Because, for example, in helicopters, you can, you can actually turn the helicopter and just you know, let the cyclic, let the cyclic go. You can do that, but not if the joystick doesn't have a spring because the joystick will eventually drop to the side, of course. Um, so it's something that I would like to do. Comparing both is really hard. They are very, very good products, very high quality, very precise. The Puma now has all sensors, so precision increased. I was very satisfied and very surprised to see how how much precision and how much better I felt using the new generation Puma because I used the generation the fourth generation one. I used it for a long time, for for years or so. So, and I just recently started using the Puma X. They are both very good. If you want to hit me up, just send me an email, Sergio at Halicimmer.com. And I'll I'll try to help you make your own mind and make your decisions based on some questions that I may I may, I may ask you or the needs that you have with uh with the joystick or with the controls. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you again for all of that stuff. So up next on Flight Simulation Association, and this is this is not quite a reveal, but unless you're one of the few people who was just scrolling our website, it's probably a reveal. We're having a really, really interesting panel discussion, one that's probably the most interesting to me because so much of what we do at Flight Sim Association and with our show Flight Sim Expo is all about how can we get the real world airline pilot industry and the flight training industry to realize that flight simulation, helicopter, civil, military, whatever, is such a key to resolving the pilot shortage and to making training easier. I was on the phone with Robert Randazzo of PMDG, and if, if you know PMDG, say say something in the comments. I'm sure some people have really heard of that name maybe once or twice in their flying careers, even though we're talking helicopters. But PMDG, we can probably sneak them in here as well. So on the phone with Robert, and we were kind of commenting, like, why are airlines in 2022 sending people home with posters of airplanes like you can't do anything with a poster you just look at it on the wall when i was doing my Embraer training and when i go for the crj here in a little while i'm going to download i actually did for the Embraer. just downloaded a copy of it in p3d and i was actually pressing the buttons and seeing the thing change i didn't need to fly it in the simulator i just wanted to be able to actually have some feedback as opposed to literally looking at a picture of something on the wall and so that kind of spawned into this conversation of let's have our next cross community panel discussion look at all this stuff and so that's exactly what we're going to do coming up on february 26th is our next cross community panel discussion all about how can flight simulation impact real world aviation so could a flight simmer who's never actually been in the 737 could they actually land that if they had to in a you know real emergency type situation and what are we already doing in home flight simulation to try to resolve this challenge so we'll have mm -hmm. robert from pmdg keith smith of pilot edge who has basically spent his whole career working on this kind of stuff and alongside them, Fabio, who you may have seen on Twitch under the Flying Fabio, and Laura Laban from Infinite Flight, which is really cool. Like, Infinite Flight has probably done more, actually, for real-world training than any of us know in desktop flight simulation because it's so easy. It's just on your phone. You don't have to do anything. You just download an app, and you can fly in a simulator. So that's coming up next on February 26th. I'm imagining, Sergio, I haven't asked you yet, but you're probably going to live stream that with us, right? Yeah, cool. nope. oh, good. <laughs> I, it's 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 one it's one of those subjects that it's very dear to me. We were actually talking about it the other day, and I talk you I told you about my own experience. Yeah, ex exactly. With, uh, so yeah. that'll be coming up next uh, for us on Flight Simulation Association. And with all of our cross-community panel discussions, you'll have lots of opportunities to win prizes. We do two raffle draws throughout those sessions. So make sure you mark your calendars. If you go to flightsimassociation.com slash webinars, you can actually get a calendar notification emailed right to you. And as always, those are totally free to participate in. So that is it for us on behalf of myself and Phil, the other co-founder of FSA. Huge thank you to Sergio for spending uh, an hour more than two hours we're getting on to with answering your questions and giving us this phenomenal overview. Uh, don't forget, if you haven't already, that you can help support us here at Flight Simulation Association by creating a free account. You also have the option to upgrade to Captain for $3 a month, help us support the costs of running the website. And in exchange, you have discounts on more than 30 different vendors across flight simulation hardware, software, and save yourself a pile of money, especially if you're thinking of getting started in home flight simulation. That's all from us. Again, big thanks. Thanks to Sergio and for everyone watching on YouTube, Facebook Live, listening on Skyblue Radio, and of course, watching on Flight Simulation Association's website. We look forward to seeing you on February 26th. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks again, Sergio. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evan. Thank you very much for being on that side, guys. See you next time.